wow, it's been that long. I'm going to try to kind of lean on this and, and speak. So thank you so much for coming out, guys. I appreciate it. It's early in the morning. I hope you got your coffee. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here at uh, Atelier. Pleasure to be on Creative Mornings. This is my favorite building in the country. So I absolutely love being here. Dennis Towers is, is beautiful. It's the, it's the first... I remember when I came back from the U.S. from college in 1998, this was being built, I believe, and it opened you know, shortly after. And uh, the awe on, on my face and everybody's face when we saw this beautiful building, and it stands you know, proudly till today. It also happens to be where my office is. So <laughs> amazing, full circle. I always dreamed of working in this building, you know? and I think it's the dream of a lot of people to actually work on this building. And when the opportunity came up, um, which I'll tell you about, uh, I, I was just, it was, uh, it was, it was crazy. Um, actually, I'll tell you that story right now. I'm going to jump back and forth between, between things. But I, um, and, and I'll come back to the power of the pita, wild pita, the restaurant, and, uh, and travel and everything like that. But uh, right now, I, uh, I run this organization called New Media Academy. And uh, it's an entity that's based over here. It was inaugurated in June two, 2020 by His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Rashid Al Maktoum. And uh, we are basically addressing three problems that we think we have in, in the region. So that's why we, we exist. On one hand, it's professional development within the digital space. So everything to do with, with digital. And you know, as you know, the, the, the government is fast moving forward into the digital era. I mean, we're, we're there, but there's a lot more that we need to do. And, um, you know, skill sets don't move as fast as strategies. So it's something that we need to, to jumpstart and we need to move faster on. So that's what we do, you know. There's the short-term solution, which is we are um, creating programs that actually help people understand the world of digital. We're a bit of a different uh, entity in that we don't believe in specialization when it comes to digital. We believe in generalization. You know, the day of specialization is, is gone. Today, if you're a superstar on social media, but you don't understand analytics, you know, it doesn't make sense. You know, if you, uh, if you are a superstar, you know, with analytics, but you don't understand uh, platforms and engagement, it doesn't make sense. You know, those days are gone. So, so that's kind of what we teach. We're very practically driven in a sense. Everything that we do is go read this, come here, let's have a conversation. Now go and implement, come back, let's review it. And that's how you gain your skills. So a bit of a different organization. But learning is a, is a big thing that we do. We also have a long-term strategy. And I was just talking to James about this. But, you know, I think uh, looking around, <clears throat> given what we want to do, there's obviously the short-term strategy. We can't wait. We have to get people from the traditional media into, you know, new media. And let's not forget that new media actually blew up in... When, when did new media blow up? When did, like, social channels and everything really, like, skyrocket? No. 15, 16, 5, 6 years ago. So if you imagine, most people started to get a grip on traditional media... You know, and especially in, in, in the region and the country over here, you know, not that long ago, right? I mean, in the 2000s, we had this boom and everybody was kind of like, you know what? We need more PR, we need more outdoor, we need more TV. And suddenly this thing called social media and the digital world fell into everybody's lap. So it took us a bit of time to, to, to get there. But um, slowly but surely, we're getting there. We are just in a position where we are jump starting this uh, right now, right? You'd be surprised. The reason why I tell you this is today you could walk into any government organization and if they have a marketing team that has 50 people, a Marcom team, you'll usually find that there'd be three to four people in the digital space. Now that's crazy. There's more people that write press releases in most government entities than people who are managing digital. That's nuts, right? In today's, in today's world. I mean, look, everybody built for traditional media in the last, you know, since 2010, 11, 12, but then social took over and we didn't move as, uh, as, as fast. That's crazy. The other thing is those three to four people, and you know how it is, like 
most of those guys who are handling digital in government entities, they're the least experienced people. So what happens is you get a fresh graduate that comes in. I mean, if you look around, you're like, who's managing digital? Oh, two, three people. Great. What is their background? They're all fresh graduates for the most part, right? Or they have a couple of years experience. And, um, but you'll always hear, you know, we have a lot of agencies that manage everything. So skill set in-house is, is just not there. And it's a, it's a, it's a major issue for, uh, uh, for, for us. Uh, because COVID taught us that the second you have to, unfortunately, cut costs and cut your agencies, there's no know-how in-house on what to do in the digital space, right? Government entities were writing about doing workout exercises during COVID. Nuts, right? So you had the space program talking about workout. You had you know, the sustainability program. And, and this is an issue. So we're bringing this you know, back in-house. The legacy that I want to leave behind when it comes to learning, you know, and I was telling James about this, I feel like today a monumental shift needs to happen when it comes to learning all the way back. We just want a program to go into every school in the whole country and train people on digital when they're aged between 13 and 18. Because today, when you graduate high school, you still know almost nothing about the digital world. All right, unfortunately, and that, that we're, we're too late. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that, that I believe in. And I think we, we ready you up at 18. The other thing is, I've got to be very cautious about how I, how I say this. I've got to be politically correct. But I think we need uh, another track in terms of what you do after high school, after you go through the program that I just mentioned. And that track is highly pl- practically driven. This is for digital, highly practically driven, much shorter than a four-year program, and certified just like any entity in, in the world, academic entity in, in the world, right? Basically, what I'm saying is, you go through our program, 13 to 18, you come out, you understand the digital world properly, you understand strategy, you understand, you, you, you know, today, if you don't know how to film and edit and do a little bit of audio, do a little bit of color grading. My God, it's crazy. You must know how to do that, and you got to teach that from a young age. You know, and, and it's not it's not difficult, but we have to embed it within the curriculum, and that's what we want to do. That's the monumental shift. Then, when you come out of high school, one year program, you don't need more than that. If you're if you got that training from 13, 18, one year program. And that certificate you get, okay, is equal to a certificate that you would get from MIT when it comes to any government entity. Again, I'm talking about the monumental shift and I'm talking about the legacy that I would like to leave behind. So in the future, I would love to see two people. And it's, it's a choice, by the way. You want to go to a four-year program, that's absolutely okay. But there should be a track where people can go to a one-year practical program, be ready, Walk into any government entity in the UAE and say, here's the certificate I have. It's not a college degree. And here's the background. And here's what I know. And that person person should have equal opportunity to somebody who brings a four-year degree from MIT. It's going to happen. And that's the, that's the, the shift that will happen. And that's the, I can't wait to see that day. So that's one of the things that I'm highly, highly involved with. So that's number one. That, that's that's the, the bigger problem, right? When you talk about the World Economic Forum and they talk about the future of jobs and everything that's happening, everything is in the digital space. We are far behind. We are we are far behind. You know, today when you look at the investment, so where all the tech is coming from today, if you look at that, one of the biggest things is they have the most amazing, the highest investment in the digital education infrastructure. So everything that's coming out today is predominantly obviously coming out from, you know, uh, the, the, the California and San Francisco area. Most of the things are coming out of there, right, in terms of ideas. And obviously there's an ecosystem, but one of the biggest things is the education around it. But look at the investment that's made in that. Similarly, if you look at the investment that's being made in China in, in digital education, it, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And that's what we need to do. That's why I loved actually hearing from, from James this morning that there's a lot of 
uh, changes happening within the uh, higher education uh, sector here in the UAE as well. So I'm very optimistic. Great things are are, are coming up. So so that's the learn. That's just the learning side. the The other problem that we're trying to solve is social media influencer marketing, and we're one of the only regions in the world where social media influencer marketing is on the decline. Everywhere else in the world, it's growing. In some parts of the world, it's doubling in size every year. That's crazy. And, you know, statistics and research tells us that, you know, people are more prone to buy something or do something if a person ha- is, is a content creator and has influenced them via their, their content. It's a known fact. Right, somebody who's trustworthy, consistent, um, is very astute, is very you know knowledgeable. It's it. I mean, it, it's amazing, and it's amazing for the for the economy. We don't have that in the in the Arab world. And here's where the problem lies. Right, look at what everything. Look at what's happening in the Arab world, where we're investing all of our money. Okay, so space, sustainability, climate change law, medicine, you know, all of that. Now, name me two or three people. Actually, name me one person in the Arab world who has the power to influence thought and action. I'm not talking about reach, right? So it doesn't matter. Tell me. Ahmed al He does. Absolutely. Good. He's, he's you know, I, I, would, I would question whether he's able to kind of influence every single one of those things. I don't know if he said, look, here's what we have to do with space that people would suddenly say, you know. So, it, it, you know, and, and, and the thing is, you know, I also, it's also very important that there are people that transcend their own countries in the Arab world. So you've got great people in Saudi Arabia, but guess what? They don't translate to the Arab world. You've got amazing people in Egypt. They don't translate out. Um, Dahir Ahmed al if you guys know him, Ahmed al is you know one of our exclusive you know influencers that we work with. We we put one video of his on our channel. Okay, this look at the power of Ahmed al Gandur, he's a personal close friend of mine. In 24 hours, we had one million YouTube followers. There is nobody else that can do that, not even Ahmed Shigiri, with all due respect to him. I, I really love Ahmed Shigiri, but but guess what? Ahmed al we still have trouble transcending the Egyptian market, you know, and it's something that we need to work towards. But, you know, for us, it's very important that when you talk about the UAE spending, I can't remember the number, I think 15 to $20 billion over the next 10 years in climate change initiatives around the world. How do we know what's happening? How do we talk about this? And COP28 is coming in two years. Who's going to talk about that? You know, and we spend all that money on space, and we have some amazing astronauts, but that, those astronauts, they're the technical people, right? They're not the people that are going to speak to us. So I think there's a lot of, lot of opportunities there, and, and we're, we're the first incubator of social media influencers in the world, which means we have a pretty simple formula. We scout a thousand people across the Arab world every year. We shortlist 300, and we do a deeper assessment of them. We take 50 and we train them for six months because we want to create more solid creators. We let 40 of them go back into the wild and we take 10, we sign them for three years exclusively and we create their brands. We help them position themselves, we help them build their brands, uh, we help them with everything. We help them how, uh, know, learn how to write, to script, to present, to build a studio. I mean, they work. And we commercialize them. And we have a Google model. You know, we take a percentage and you take a percentage and you, know, you take the biggest percentage. And for us, we're, we're not a for-profit company. We take that money and we invest it back in everybody. Now, with the 10 that we sign, we sign 10 every year. And I think if I create 100 solid influencers, and that doesn't mean they have to have 10 million followers. I mean, if you have 400,000 people and you have a solid, engaged audience in a sector that's important for us, that's amazing. If I create 100 of these, the industry will change in the entire Arab world because we don't have this today, right? So again, one of the legacies that I, I would love to leave behind, I just, I just created, uh, I have the MVP done. 
So people say, yeah, you know, you talk about creating an influencer. I'm talking about a sustainable influencer. My mandate is to get them out of government jobs because government pays so well. I have to be, you know, I have to, I have to kind of compete against these high salaries, you know, but I've done it. I took a guy who came to me last year, Ahmed al Marzugi. I took a guy who came to us with 60,000 followers on Instagram who never showed his face and would just write scripts. And he was, he was amazing. He'd write about economy, but in a very simple way. And today he's sitting at almost 600,000 followers, transcended the UAE across the region. He's on multiple platforms. He's got over 100,000 uh, followers on TikTok with, with, with content around the economy. Okay. Yeah, I mean it is, and it, it is, it is unreal. And 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 I'll, I'll give you some numbers as well. You know, I'd love to to, to share that as well. So he had a, a very nice engineering job in Abu Dhabi, and we our plan was that in two years we would get to two hundred thousand followers, and he would be making ten thousand dollars a month revenue from content. And he committed to us that in two years, if we hit that number, which was below what he was making, that he would quit his job, that he would quit his job. We actually, so he's at 600,000, it's just been a year and three months, all right? And he's making much, much more money than that. And what is the market demand for Ahmed and Mazuri? What is the market saying, here's what your single post is worth? Last year, at exactly this time, I remember it, last year we sold his first post for $1,300, okay? And we were like, yes, you know, he's making money. Today, if people offer him $20,000 for a post, you have to think twice about that. And he's booked up way in advance. And he's gotten calls from everybody who's everybody in, in the country. So the MVP's there. And we have another three as well that we've, we've actually built. So he's in economy. The number two person we have is in women empowerment. And she's a young lady called Nathan Hamlet, who's a superstar, who I cannot believe last year at this time, we put, for the first time, we put a camera in front of her to speak into the camera, and we had to call an ambulance because she fainted. But watch her content today, Nathan Hamlet. You will be shocked. She is a superstar. Unreal. So, uh, so that's that. We have somebody in medicine, we have somebody in law, and it's, and it's really good. So that's the second problem that we're, we're facing. And I think that monumental shift, you know, um, I always say, I always talk about this. Have, you guys have heard of the... the it's called the Social Summit, right? In in Portugal? Yeah. The the Web Summit. Web Summit, sorry, not Social Summit. The Web Summit. So I was having a look, right? Um, the year that we had COVID, 700 speakers from over 100 countries. You name the country and they're there, all right? Probably Guyana was not there and the Democratic Republic of Congo was not there. Every other country was there. Guess what? Not one Arab. I looked at Coachella the same year. And I saw 150 acts, and I was like, wow, there's got to be one Arab. It's impossible, you know. I look, zero Arabs. And it's not that we don't have the talent to get there. They don't have the digital strength to be on the map globally. I mean, you guys know Daffy and Flipperachi from Bahrain and Kuwait? These guys should be at Coachella. These guys would rock Coachella. But they don't have big enough uh, you know, profiles online for people out there to say, we got to get these guys, which is crazy to think, right? You've got people singing in Japanese, you know, in, in French and Spanish, you name it, in Zulu, you know, and, and, and they're there and, and, and we're not. So, again, monumental shift. I'd love to, to see that happen. I think those two guys will, will be at Coachella uh, very soon. The third, the third thing that we do is um, content, you know, and today... Um, statistics tell us there's anywhere between 0.8 and 3% Arabic content online. It's a big problem. It's nothing. You could blink and you miss Arabic content, right? The bigger problem is that the consumption of Arabic content is around 6%. So the opportunity to consume Arabic content is 6x. You know, it's huge. Success. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so six times what's actually out there, which means everybody in the region is consuming international content of all languages, Turkish, Spanish, English. And, and so, you know, we're in the business of creating Arabic content and encouraging people to create Arabic content, to be on part of the world. And we 
tell our own stories, you know, we narrate our own stories with our own nuances. And hey, we can have subtitles so people from around the world can watch Arabic content. You know, the other way around. Now, here's the other thing. If you break down that Arabic content online, 90% of it is entertainment content. And a lot of entertainment content is great. We need that, right? We need this outlet to go out. You know, everybody has you know, some sort of stress in their life. They want to go out, they want to laugh, they want to smile, they want to enjoy. But hey, you can't have 90% of Arabic content being entertainment. You know, the content can't be just, hey, I just ate 20 burgers. You know, here's how I feel. Or, you know, it can't. It, it can't all be that. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about producing Arabic content that is valuable and therefore engageable and therefore shareable or shareable and engageable, right? That is the key. So today, where is the content on in Arabic on history or geography or space? or sustainability, or climate change. Oh my God, there's barely any climate change content in English, but there's nothing in Arabic. And we're hosting COP28 in two years. We need a ton of this content. So that's another problem that we wanna, we wanna address as well. And, and we do that by uh, obviously creating the, the right influencers that would create the right content. All right, so I think that that's kind of, so the monumental shift there is, is really in, 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 uh, in, in education, you know, and, and uh, and I always say, I'm not in the business of education, I'm in the business of learning, you know, um, because we're not, you know, CAA certified, we don't have a certified program, but what we think is that we practically will get you ready to go into that job and be successful, all right? So I think that that's critical for us. Um, by the way, our lead academic, just so you know, so I, I also believe in accessibility. Our lead academic is the former... Um, educator for the master of digital program at Duke University. But we keep it in the US so I can keep the cost super low. And we do a program that's like a mini MBA at like seven hundred dollars. I think mini MBAs are at nine thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. I don't believe in it. I think that seven hundred dollars is too high for me. But it's what I can do right now. You know, when 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 you can learn and get something in your hand that will cost you you know, nothing, without having, having you depend on somebody else paying for you to learn, then I think we've, we've, we've hit it, you know? If I can get it down to $50, $60, that'll be phenomenal, you know? So, so that's, that's something that we want to do. So how did I get this job? It's crazy, okay? I love this job. I mean, this is stuff that I, that I absolutely love. So I, I did some work with the DIFC across the street. I was the senior vice president for, for marketing and, and communications, and I love that place. I think it's the best place in the world to work and hang out. It's phenomenal. And, uh, and we did a lot of stuff around, you know, the financial centers, the, the, the model is, is, is amazing because uh, technically around the world, there isn't an owner of a financial center, right? So there's, there's people that own buildings, and they kind of come together, and this bank takes this building, and somebody opens a mall, somebody opens a... And then they call it, hey, that's the financial center. The model is different here because there's one owner of the whole thing. And therefore, you, you can do a lot with it, right? You can have events and you can build a mall and you can do so many things, which, which is amazing. I think there's a, there's a great uh, um, opportunity here and, and they're doing a great job. But I just happened to organize a meeting with a former friend who, who works upstairs at the executive office, who's the, the, the CEO of the executive office with the CEO of the IFC. Funny story, I swear to God. I mean, I was, I was happy and I loved it there. And I was standing right outside. Uh, I organized that, that meeting. And on the day of the meeting, our CEO at the DIFC couldn't make the meeting. So I had to call and apologize profusely, you know, about taking this time. And, uh, and I said, look, what, do you guys, what else are you guys doing? You know, I, I love what's happening over there. And he said, you know, would you like to be involved in some of this stuff? And I said, yes, thinking, you know, a board, you know, or some committee or something like that. And as I get a call the next day and they're like, hey, come, let's have a chat. And literally walked in here, had a chat. And they're like, we have this idea to new media. That's all we're going to tell you. But we'd love for you to run it. Uh, the only thing is you got to join like tomorrow. You know, and you're going to sign on this contract, but we can't tell you anything about it because the finance is going to announce it. You know, but we've heard you're that kind of guy, you know. 
<laughs> I swear to God, I, I, I kid you not. And then I, I, I was like, I love it. I'm doing it. I went straight to the CEO and I said, I'm, I'm leaving. And I, yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> it was not, it was not a thing. But, you know, the team was, was all set up and everything. I, I ended up staying for two more weeks, making sure that everything was handed over. But I joined here not knowing any of what I just told you. Not knowing any of it. And that was a you know huge shift. But I just loved it so much, the thought of anything to do with new media and, and really monumental shift and change. I loved it so much. I was like, I'll take her. I'm down. It doesn't matter what the title is. It doesn't matter, you know what? Because I want to build it. You know, and I, and I, I love it. I'm, I'm super happy with that, uh, that decision. Let's go backwards. So, what was I doing before that? I was just traveling the world and shooting videos uh, and doing YouTube, and, and it, was, it was fantastic. I was doing a lot of, a lot of work and uh, a great time. I mean, I, I believe in today's world, and I, and I taught myself everything to do with content. And today. Please, 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 for everybody who's watching, for everybody who's, who's here, please learn how to create content and create every single day. It gives you an edge like nothing else. You could have any job in the world, but if you have the ability to create content, you immediately are on a different level, all right? And I, and, I, and I truly mean that. I think the future is going to be, there's going to be another monumental shift. The future is going to be how organizations use their voices to grow their reach. We don't do this. I recently had a client and a friend who's a major bank in the country who's got 6,000 employees. And I said, oh my God, if you know, 10% of those employees post every single day messages that we give them about what we're doing, and I mean the bank, my God, how you could power the algorithm is unbelievable. Now imagine, Everybody does that. You wouldn't need influencer. You wouldn't need PR. You wouldn't. It's not, you know, it's planned. So, so let's say that you have an event, right? And you're creating messaging anyways. And you're writing all this in a press release. And you're putting this on TV. All we're saying is take bits of that and give it to employees. Now, employees are living it already. You know, and, and this, is a, this, is a, this is a big thing. I'm a big believer in doing things in-house. By the way, I believe influencer marketing also is going to come in house. This business of, you know what, I need somebody to engage with my message. Let me go to a comedian because he has 2 million followers and, and tell him this message on government policy and people are going to, I mean, that, that's, that's going to be gone very soon. Okay. Um, and again, another monumental shift that I would love to see, which I'm actually working on, which we, we got our first client is which entity is going to actually recruit their future influencers? And we're going to help them build it. Okay, so today, think about what I just told you with Ahmed al-Mazuri, who, who, who talks, you know, about in the economy. So if we do work with DIFC, DIFC is going to pay him $20,000 for every post. To really get action, you're going to spend millions of dollars. Now, what if you gave me four or five people that are fresh graduate, and I take them and I turn them into Hamdan Mazuri's for you, and now they're your voice. You'd spend much less than millions of dollars. That's going to happen as well. That's going to be another monumental shift. I think org structures are going to change. Roles are going to change all across the government, here and everywhere else. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of it's just a matter of time, and I, I can't wait to to see that. Prior to that, we had a TV show. And how did we do this TV show? Prior to the TV show, we had a restaurant called Wild Peter. And the success of, of Wild Peter really was that we used content and social media. We did nothing else. We had no money for anything else because all the money went into the restaurant. So we used social media in the, in the, in the way that we thought it should be used. And that is documenting everything that we did and involving everybody that's listening to us and watching us in everything that we did. So Randa will tell you, you know, our menu was based on what the audience wanted before we opened. The color of our chairs and the walls were all based on what people wanted. I mean, you name it, everything we did was based on the audience. That restaurant technically is the audience's, right? 
So I think that was uh, it was it was so powerful. I mean, we we talked about it. We, we we spoke at TED. Um, we love the concept of you know uh, being social. You know how right now you watch a show and you have hashtags on the screen that says engage with it. I kid you not. We are the first people that ever did that in the world. And I remember when we went to, because uh, we had our shows on, on Dubai TV and we were funded by Google and uh, 2454 and Intercontinental Hotels. And I remember when we said, hey, we're going to put a hashtag on screen to think. People are like, why? Why would you ever do that? We're the first people that put you know, people's tweets on screen. We're the first people in the world that ever put a QR code on screen. People are like, why would anybody want to QR code and get that song onto their phone and listen to it later on? I said, because that's going to be the future. That's how people engage. And that, I think that was a major monumental shift. You know? We were the first, I'm, I'm pretty sure of this, you know, I'd, say, I'd say I'm 90, 99% sure that we're the first production company that took a social media manager with us as part of their production crew. It wasn't happening. I'm talking about 2009, 10, guys. Okay, Facebook and Twitter had just opened over here. It never happened, right? And as a result of everything that we did, we got a call one day. My brother and I, we had shot two seasons of Peter Plan. We traveled to 24 countries. By the way, we, had, we knew nothing about media. We learned everything. And that's the power of the internet today. You can learn anything. We knew nothing. But we put a 10-man crew together, 10 men and women, and we traveled to 24 countries in two years. The shows were, you know, it was a million-dollar show for, for a year. It's phenomenal. And then after we finished the show, we get a call, and they're like, hi, we're calling from President Bill Clinton's office. And President Clinton is, is a big fan. We'd love for you guys to come to New York and speak at the Clinton Global Initiative. And, and we said, oh my God, we sell shawarmas. Yeah. <laughs> You can want us to go and speak to people who are, you know, building Teslas. And, and it, was, it was amazing. And, and we met President Barack Obama. Um, it was just, it was, it was fantastic. But that's the power of content, nothing else. How did they know? These two, you know, I, I, always, I always refer to myself as the kid from Dubai because I remember when I went to the U.S. in the 90s, and people are like, well, who are you? And I said, I'm a kid from Dubai. And they're like, where's Dubai? You know? Man, I love saying that right now, everywhere else in the world. I'm a kid from Dubai, you know? Um, but this is the power of content. That's been the biggest, biggest shift. And I think, you know, we talk about innovation a lot. Innovation for me is, you know, and I think the biggest innovation you could make is to go out and create content every single day on whatever it is that you love. It will change, it will give you a power that you can't imagine, you know? And I don't mean power, King Kong power. It'll give you satisfaction, it'll give you learning, it'll give you connections, and it will give you the ability to be on a different level when it comes to your skill set in anything that you do. It does not matter what you do, you know? That is the power of content. And we're still at the beginning of it, by the way. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I was thinking about vlogging on YouTube, but I think it's dead. No, it's not dead. We're just at the beginning. We, it's going to grow every single day, you know? So, so I think, um, you know, I, I always come back to this, this content uh, story because, you know, New Media Academy, you know, the bottom line is we want to teach everybody and we want to encourage everybody and empower everybody agnostic of what you do to become content creators, all right? And I tell you, we will all benefit out of that, everybody, the region and the world, you know? So crazy stuff, you know, monumental shifts has, has been a part of my thing. I, I, you know, I, I speak five languages and, I, and I, my father tells me this because English is my first language. Um, and I, I asked my father one day, I said, how did I learn English like so early and so well? And he, and, and he told me the story. So my brother is three years older than me, Mohammed, who is my, my partner and, and my best friend. And we, we travel together and we do our shows together and our restaurant together. And he, he went to, obviously he went to school before me. And he would come home and he would speak English with my father in the house. And I was like, I got to do this. And I learned English at the age of two and a half, three. 
straight. I went to I went to kindergarten, you know, and I and I deeply learned English. I went to school. I graduated college. And I graduated high school at sixteen. Um, I always wanted to be an athlete. It was my it was my dream. And I was very I was bulky. I mean, bulkier than I am today. Kandora is great though. I can hide it all. It's perfect. I couldn't hide it when I was wearing uniforms in school. But I was always bulky and. People would not let me play in sports. So I grew up always around the sports teams, but I couldn't play, you know? So, so I remember in ninth grade, I was like, I'm going to play tennis. And I played tennis and I was on the national team here. It's fantastic. And then, but I was like, I love soccer. I love football. That's what I want to do, you know? And they would not let me play. So in 10th grade, I said, you know what? I'm going to play soccer every single day for the next two years. All right, and fast forward two years later, I wanted to go pro soccer. I was one of the top scorers in, in a lot of leagues over here. I was the captain of the football team in school, it was crazy. Um, and I almost went pro, we just didn't have a pro league over here. But that was a, that was a, that was a big shift for me as well. You know? And I, I think, I don't know, I have this thing where I, I, you know, if, I, if I set my mind to something, I, I get it done. I, I didn't know how to run a restaurant when we ran a restaurant. I didn't know how to produce TV shows when we were running a TV show. You know, I, I didn't know anything about financial centers. I, I didn't know anything about transportation when I worked with the RTA in, in Dubai, and I, I'm responsible for the campaign around the Dubai Metro completely. The name of it, everything, A to Z. You know, and uh, I'm very fortunate to have been able to present that to His Highness, and he's like, this is a great idea. I love it. You know, let's roll with it. Um, so, so every step of the way, you know, I think, I've always been open to that that shift and that that change. Um, I'm a big believer in um, vision boards. So I don't know if you guys do that. I'm a huge believer in that. I have a bunch of things on there, uh, and I'm, I'm constantly thinking about uh, about that. But I'm also never afraid to make these shifts. You know, I, I've always said if if I want to do it, I I. I can and I will and I will work as hard as possible to make it happen. And I think that is the that is the one thing that all of us can do. Effort level, we all have the ability to do it. It's a skill that you have to build. It's not something that you're born with where you say, you know what? It's something that you can do. Absolutely. And I, and I believe that's probably been the driver of everything that I've done. I've gone over time a lot, but... Uh, are we? I, I. I mean, look. That's that's uh, that's that's my story. There's a lot of there's a lot of things in there, um, but alhamdulillah, you know, everything's uh, God is great, as they say. You know, um, I'm happy to have like a, a greater conversation with you guys. And I just want to kind of fill you in on some of the things that I've done, and if there's anything that you have in mind, I'd love to love to discuss. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Just to see the, uh, the oh my god, yeah, sure. Please subscribe to my channel. I need more subscribers. <laughs> so I when when I so after we did our TV show, we, we, we went to YouTube and I have my own channel. And I do things around Maybe you can watch it later on. I just want to kind of, but, but I mean, I uh, I do content around food, and tra food travel and culture. And the TV show that, that we had, by the way, we traveled around the world to 24 countries dressed like this. I've been to I've been to 50 over 50 countries dressed like this. And one of the reasons we did that was because you know in in uh, years ago, you know, we realized suddenly we're like when we watch TV, global news, every time we see somebody dressed like this, it's not in a positive way. You know, and it's always on TV. So we said, you know what? We want to be the first people that you meet dressed like this, who are just like you. And we traveled the world. We talked about music. We talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about food. And we created a lot of great connections, great friendships. And, you know, I think if we do more of that, the world would be, you know, a, a better place. So that, that's what the show uh, was. 
And now we're on, we're, we're all on YouTube, but I'm on YouTube, please follow me. And uh, I'd love to have more subscribers, but anything to do with food, culture, and travel, that's some of the content that I, that I produce. Thank you so much, guys. You had a question, I think. Oh. <laughs> oh another one? Gotcha. Actually, I have a lot more than three, but I've narrowed <laughs> them down to three for now. Um, one question was around, you mentioned that you're the only one world where um, influencer marketing is declining. Is in a decline. Do you have Three. reasons why or a hypothesis as to why? Hmm. The second question was regarding the academy. Are you guys virtual? Mm -hmm. uh, or are you like, so will you be open for people from all around? You don't have to come here. The third one was, um, what would happen? Ah, how, how do you guys, and I'm sure this is part of your academy, how do you guys do the balance between um, paid content and keeping uh, a certain amount of, uh, what's it called, like independence so that it's, it's not diluted? You know what I mean? So let's say somebody is a health, Care professional and they're getting paid content for X Y Z. Where is there like a specific direct, direction or line around? Do they get paid to promote something that is actually not hmm. McDonald's or whatever, right? And and there would be like a contradiction between what they're getting paid to do and what they're actually standing for in terms of their uh, trustworthiness. Gotcha. Question one and three are kind of linked together, by the way. So so here's the thing, right? We we believe. Why, why are we in this situation? So once again, all of this boom happened in 2015, 16. What happened? Platforms said, we need some role models. We need people that, that are up there, that everybody else says, I want to be like them, right? On YouTube, it was Casey Neistat in the US, and they had people over here. Now, what happened was, in the region, social media came late already, you know? And already people were not using it regularly or in the best way possible. So guess what the platforms did? The platforms went and said, you know, here's four or five people that are regularly posting. Let's bump them up and make them the role models. All right. So and and that's that's how any any business works, right? You need somebody who is your idea virus. Okay? That's, that's what they call it. You want that person who's going to to be the voice and everything. So so that happened. They propped up a few people and Everybody was talking about social, so brands are like, wow, if we don't work on social, we, we're, we feel like we're going to be left out. So who do we work with? These four or five people. And you had every brand in the region working with the same four people, right? It didn't matter what they did. They're like, they have a million followers, just pay them, whatever. And pay them. So unfortunately, we created this, this, this mess a little bit, right? And it's because the focus was on reach, not on engagement. Now it's changing. Now it's not about, you know, this person has 2 million followers. It's about, hey, 200,000 followers, really good engagement, you know, and they have a good know-how. That's who we work with. And, and, and that has been the issue that we're trying to, uh, to address. I've seen time and time again, you know, people here, iPhone user, every single day. You're out in the open. You're using iPhone. And suddenly you're promoting Honor Arabia. Hi, I love this phone. No, you don't. You're paid for it. You know more than that. You know you're you're a, you're you're doing something in a certain industry, and suddenly you're you're talking about you know public policy. It, it just doesn't work. And I think the issue is that there's a there's a there's a lot, right? So one of it is that. So there's partially the blame is on platforms. Partially the blame is on is on timing. Partially the blame is on agencies. Partially the blame is on the creator because they took everything. Right? They're like, we'll do it. You know, American Express, we'll do it. You know, uh, RTA taxi, we'll do it. And that, that's, a, that's a problem because you created this scenario where the audience is like, we don't know what's real anymore. You know, so, so I think that was the thing. And the focus is so much on, on numbers other than anything else. Um, the other thing that happened, by the way, again, which we're addressing is content creators or influencers in the region make the bulk of their money on brand partnerships. They don't do anything else. Look at content creators around the world. It's not just the content, right? Everybody has a learning program. Everybody has a book. Everybody has merchandise. Everybody does, you know, so many things. So you're making money from so many places. So you don't mind if a brand comes to you and says, hey, 
you know, uh, I know your 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 content is in in health and fitness, but you know, I want you to promote Pepsi and maybe diet Pepsi because it helps. People would say no. Here, people would say, I'll do it. Like I can, you know, I can make it work. So I think that's one of the biggest things that's happened. Look what we do with our creators. You will never find any of our creators who's in one industry doing something that just doesn't make sense. It's it's building the brand, right? We are very you know, laser focused on helping them build brands, not making money today. It's not the goal, right? The money is it will, will come, and it will exponentially come to you in the future if you build the right brand. So those two are kind of uh, kind of related. The middle question was about um, virtual. Everything we do right now is virtual, all right? We don't do anything non-virtual, and the reason for that is just cost. It's very simple. The, you know, we feel that the greatest people that we can learn from are not based here today, and to bring them over just has a huge cost, and we have to, you know, put that on to the, to the, to the person who's learning. We don't want to do that. You know, so in, in my mind, I'm always looking for ways to make this, you know, as simple as possible. You know, tr learning. He here's one of the other problems that we're now facing. There's a hundred platforms that tell you, pay $10 a month and you have access to 40,000, 50,000, you know, courses. And what's happened here is I go to a government entity and I'm like, look, we have this solid program. We're going to turn your marketing team into digital, you know, proper professionals that could run things. And they say, well, we're subscribed to this thing and we pay a hundred dollars a year and they have access to 40,000 courses. We have everything that you're going to offer, but at this rate, nobody is taking anything. The completion rate is under 10% and the learning is almost zero. I mean, people are running these things and they're not watching, they're not doing anything. And that's, you know, so now, and which is why I was telling you accessibility, right? I'm going to do, you know, I wouldn't say hand holding, but a lot more engaged you know a, a learning with practical training at a cost that's not exactly that ten dollars a month but not very far off from it enough for you to say you know what if my employer is not going to help me learn i can afford it in my in my thing that's the way that i look at it right and i look at starting from a fresh graduate you know what what rev, what uh, you know salary they earn and how much they're willing to just spend on learning every single every single month it's all doable Everything is doable. And by the way, you, I mean, learning is free. You can go online and learn everything if you want. But I think what we offer in terms of learning is, is a different model because you get to come, you get to engage with, you know, Matt Bailey, who's a professor at Duke University. You get to engage with Caleb Gardner, who's a former advisor to President Barack Obama. You get to, to engage with the guy that advised Richard Branson on the Virgin brand. And you're still paying that small fee. And that conversation and those things that you hear, I mean, that, that, you might, you might be able to hear it, but will you be able to engage with them? We're, we're offering that as well. And content creators. So we're, we're still not there, but we're working on it. And with technology, it's helped us a lot. You know, I'm building a lot of tech in-house to help make this, you know, as, as cheap as possible. I'm not opposed to doing things offline, by the way. It, it, you, I just got to get the numbers right. You know, that, that for me, it's all about that. I like what you said in the beginning about... Um thought leadership and creating content with substance. And actually, we've had this conversation at Atelier like uh, two weeks ago about um, the role of the Arabic language and like has it evolved with like all the innovations that that's been happening in the world. Then also, you know, we refer to the region. Everyone in the region speaks Arabic, but there's so many dialects, etc. And Fusha doesn't like, so Fusha is just for the non-Arabic speakers. It's like the formal Arabic that we're taught in school, but no one speaks it. Like yeah. no one else yeah um like it just doesn't resonate with people so like mm. do, i just want to understand like or do you have any views on like the role of arabic language or how do you tackle that with creating like content with substance or yeah. like what's your yeah. strategy look I, I think the benefit to all of us is it's easier said than done but the benefit to all of us is when we have you know voices that transcend uh, a certain country or a certain region. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we have superstar content creators in Morocco um, that have you know, struggled to get audiences outside. It's not impossible. It's, it's there. But I think the focus has always been, and it's always like that, right? And Emirati says, again, look at the, the old mentality was always, I'm doing this because I want to be popular. I'm doing this because I want to walk into a mall and people are like, hey, how are you? It's not about the brand. It's about the fame. 
You know what I mean? So you've always been so focused on your immediate community, people like you knowing you, that you haven't thought about this greater market outside. You know, when I, when I say somebody here should create their own merchandise, I'm talking about creating merchandise for the U.S. audience, for Europe, for Asia, not just for the Arab world, right? So I, I think we, we certainly have these conversations with our creators in terms of what do you do that doesn't change who you are, but allows you to engage with other people in different parts of the Arab world. A lot of that really is, is just, you know, uh, having conversations with people, you know, and just opening your, your, your minds and your thoughts to things that are happening out, out, outside. Not politically, just things that people are interested in, you know. I, I've seen, to me, you know, obviously the biggest market in the region is, is Saudi, right? Like you want to you get a Saudi audience in America that pays you really, really good, good money. Egypt is, is the audience which, you know, is huge and, and accessible quite a bit. But Morocco, underdeveloped, huge opportunities in Morocco. Sudan, oh my God, huge opportunities in Sudan. Nobody takes it back. When was the last time you saw an Arab content creator who's not Sudanese say, I'm going to go hang in Sudan and, and you'll create content with these rappers and, and go to the pyramids that were there before the pyramids in Egypt. And I, nobody's done that. It's not because, you know, because it's not sexy. You know, people are like, I, I don't want to do that. But that's what gets you real growth with greater audiences. You know, so I think there, there's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. The language barrier, by the way, I've met a lot of Moroccans that can tone down the Moroccan accent and speak, you know, Arabic. It's, it's not even about the accents. It's even about like um, like how it appeals to, I mean, a lot of Arabic speakers who yeah. don't necessarily who are not necessarily comfortable with the language or like want to become more comfortable with like understanding the gotcha, language. Gotcha, gotcha. Like, well, look, the the thing is that. We the, the the bigger opportunity today is in the Arabic language. So I'm not even talking about people in the region who who are Arabs who speak English, like myself, who consume the majority of the content in English. The opportunity is huge and much needed in, in, in Arabic. That's why New Media Academy, we do nothing but Arabic. And we don't encourage anything but Arabic today. Not because there isn't an opportunity in English, but because the bigger opportunity lies in, uh, in Arabic. And we've got to laser focus on it. We're losing, uh, we're, we're losing things, but we're losing a lot of people to other languages and other other content. But today you have gamers, right? But do you do a colloquial, like colloquial, so the Emirati speaks to the Emirati, the Moroccan speaks to the, is that how you, is that the strategy right now? We, yeah, I mean, look, we, we, for the most part, we tell you not to change who you are and how you do things, but also create collaborations with other people from different places. And in those conversations, kind of change your, your tone a little bit, maybe speak in, in, in white Arabic. Um, but but generally we don't we don't we don't get people to we don't get people to change who they are you know it, you it's about interests think about gamers you know think about gamers in the region they're all connected they're all buying things from each other they were the first people to sell NFTs they're the first people to I mean it's crazy gamers 14 15 year olds they're speaking to each other they're playing you know my little nephew plays on a team people he has my nephew doesn't speak Arabic. You know, and he's playing with a, a Saudi guy and another guy, I think, from, from Egypt. They're on the same team and they're playing a game. It's that content that's connecting them, right? And eventually it turns into conversations, eventually it turns into relationships and it turns into friendship. And I think that's the power. Content creators now, if you look at some of the top content creators, they, they create their content and they are now translating everything they've done before into other languages, right? So the way to think about it is where are the audiences um, Indonesia? Indonesian language, huge, you know, uh, Spanish, you're huge, Russian. I mean, I think in the top 100 content creators of the world, half of them are, are Russian. You know, so that's big. And then Arabic, obviously, with 400 million you know, population. So huge opportunities. And it's actually, as a content creator, doing that adds so much power, like revenue to your, to, to your, to your world that you can't imagine. And, the, and just translating, just putting subtitles on things, but on a different channel, by the way. Don't make the mistake of putting all the languages on one channel, creating new channels. This is a new business model, by the way. There's people that you go to right now that just take your English videos and they tell you, okay, we do every video in Arabic and it costs this much. We do every video in Indonesian, it costs this much. And they'll build it in whatever Gary's language you want. Gary's, Gary's doing that as well. He's got four now, right? Four languages. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening in the Arab world. You know, there's a lot happening here. If you're not, uh, you know, attached to it somewhere or the other. I mean, look at all the musicians that are in the Arab world nowadays. Right? I have a daughter. She's 10 Mashallah. years old. Mashallah. She's crazy about digital stuff. She spends hours, actually, on the computer and she loves to create stuff. So, what do you advise me to do with her that will really help her in the future? Wow. Ten, look, 10 is... We actually signed somebody last year who was 10 years old, and it's a completely different ball game. Yeah, amazing. I just mean in the world of content, you're gonna have you're gonna you're gonna face two issues. One is platforms don't encourage a lot of this under under the age of 13. So you're gonna struggle a little bit there. The other thing is I, I actually have not built the team to handle anybody under 13. It's a completely different thing. You need completely different insights, completely different research, a completely different content strategy. It's, it's totally, totally different. But what I encourage you to keep her doing is to learn everything about content creation. Learn how to video, edit, sound, and do some basic graphics. Oh, sorry, I forgot, script writing. The power today of people that are good at writing a script before they deliver something, I mean, that is unreal. If you just get her on those, in the next three years, she'll be a super duper star, no doubt. And if she needs any help, Support. Once you turn 13, sure. awesome. Riman, just a comment on the influencer. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Anas. Part of what I do is I advise companies and clients on picking the right influencer. So they won't be doing, okay, I'm going to do this for the money's sake. Um, like last month, I received an ad on a credit card for one of the banks in the UAE, no names. And I saw Lionel Messi is there holding the credit card. Me being nosy and in the content, right click, search with Google with this image. He has the same image with different multiple credit cards across stores. Like, for God's sake, can't you do just another photo shoot for the respect of the clients? Like, yeah. uh, it is also happening worldwide. It's not just here mm. in the region. Looking at influencers worldwide, they also do the same mistakes. Yeah. We blame agencies, we blame the clients, we blame others not to get into such courses and because this is a must know. Mm. Like, you, know you can't escape. Uh, if, if I resonate with leaders uh, of companies and they tell me, well, look, we hate social. Mm. I tell them, I hate email, but I have to do it, right? It's not an option anymore. It's a must because a wrong tweet can cost you your CEO life. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's it's really all about um, strategy and sticking to strategy. It's it's about brand building. And if you don't brand build, Messi, I mean, he's the kind of guy that could do it. Yeah, he can. <laughs> I, I get it. I mean, he. I mean, there's people that can do that can do anything. But you know, that celebrity status is a completely different thing, right? But when you talk about um, the social media influencer, they got to be very cautious about this thing. By the way, I know all the agencies that are handling social media influencers in the region. They're all my friends. They're all doing a great job, but they're doing a different job. Their job, their business model is very simple. Get you at, at when you're at a high in terms of reach and make money on your reach. It's the opposite of what we do completely. We don't want you when you have 10 million followers. We want you when you have zero followers. Because we want to help you understand what it means to be a, a brand. You know, we've learned. We learn brands. Brands are all over us. Every one of us is wearing some sort of brand. We want the, the person to be like that. And you have to uh, nurture them from a, from, a, from a small stage. So I think that, that's the key for us. We don't go in at that, at that high level. And, and look, there's a lot of people that have come to us that have, have actually said, you know what, we've done some things, some things have worked, some things are not, it's slowing down, and we, we help and advise them as well. Because by the way, in the New Media Academy, we're not, a, we're not a social enterprise, but we're not a for-profit enterprise. Whatever we make, we want to cover operations and we invest back into the three things I told you. We never keep money. That's how, that's how we operate. It's not about making profit, so. I saw your recent program with uh, one of the Rashid College. That oh, amazing, yeah. yeah. Hey, I, I think, I think, I mean, the last thing I know we're, we're waiting, you know, for me, I don't think people should head a marketing department. 
or an organization if they are not digitally inclined. And I think that's going to come to an end soon, right? Because the people that hold the money and the decision making, my God, if they don't know everything about digital, we're not, the, the speed is going to be super slow. There are certainly people who don't know a lot, but understand how to make things happen. But they're far and few in between. So to me, I think the future is, you know, once again, it's just like having a CPA, right? Why don't we have the same thing for digital? You think about it. When you're, when you, a lot of times, and that's still the case, right? You want to be the head of finance, like, you have a CPA, because if you don't, I have to think twice about, or I mean, big organizations, right? It should be a similar thing for digital. There is, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we want to be stricter on the digital side. We, we want to say there's, there's no chance. You either take it or you, <laughs> you don't. I hope that happens. That would be great for all of us. Really, that would be amazing for all of us. Because you have to train from the bottom and make sure the top are aligned with everything. So, thank you so much, guys. This was amazing. I appreciate it. Thank you.